I had the experience of seeing myself, my body, it was leaning against a tree, the car, I was in a really bad car accident, and I was in the white light. Then a voice said to me, You're, you need to go back, your father wants you to stay. Hi, my name is AJ Parr. I'm a reporter, also an author, and I've published over 20 books in Amazon about spirituality. And right now I'm working on a new series about near-death experiences and the afterlife. So uh, today I have a really interesting guest who precisely came here to talk about these topics. His name is Dr. Lawrence Brock. He's from Kingsburg, New Jersey, and uh, he's got really interesting things to share with us today. Hi, Dr. Brock. Hi, thanks for having me on your show. So Dr. Brock is counselor in Kingsburg, New Jersey. He is a doctor of, of spiritual science with a postgraduate degree in advanced ministerial counseling. He had a near-death experience in 1976. And after this, he led a spiritual life and also get, gained certain abilities, which we will mention later. And uh, presently, he offers his services as a healer, basically. So can you tell us about the, your near-death experience? I understand it was in the 70s, like I yes. mentioned. And can you tell us uh, under what conditions, what happened? Yes, I would had been living in Colorado in the United States, and I came back to the Northeast and uh, my parents lived in Rye Brook, New York, and I came back to visit them. And I drove all the way back from Col my roommate in Colorado was a friend of mine from high school. So his parents lived in the same area. So we drove back and we drove straight through, which is like 2000 miles. And then we both went home to kind of rest a little bit and we heard about a party a friend of ours from high school was having so we went to the party i took my mom's car because we had drove his car back from colorado i didn't have mine and he took his car and we went to the party we were partying you know drinking and smoking pot and probably other things that um so it was kind of a funny story because I was a little high and or thought I was a little high. And, uh, but I told the young lady who was having the party, I was going to leave my car there because I was too high to drive. But really my main motivation was to be able to go back the next day and flirt with her. Okay. And but were you drunk and stuff? I was definitely drunk and high. Yes. Okay. And, but so I was, yeah. in, you know, I was in my twenties and it was in the seventies where, People didn't think about that. Yeah, I graduated from high school in 1975. Yeah, so I, know, I, I remember those just crazy <laughs> years, <laughs> those parties. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So almost back to my parents, my friend drove me. I realized my sister needed the car the next day for work because she was okay. in there. So I had my friend bring me back to the party. So I went, I went in to tell the young lady that I was taking my car. And I remember... I still can, in my memory, I still have a vision of walking toward the door to leave the party. Okay. And I could, I mean, when I look at that memory, like I don't drink it. Well, I drink very rarely now, but if I was like that, I wouldn't have driven because you, you know, it was too colorful and kind of hazy when you drink too much. And um, I don't actually remember leaving the party. The next thing I remember is I was out of my body looking down on my, my body was leaning against a tree with my legs straight out on the ground and a police officer was crouching over me. The car was smashed beyond what you'd think someone could survive. And my head was cracked open. Did you yeah. recognize it was you? Did you know it was you? Yes, or I knew it was me. Definitely. All the time. Could you, yes. were you conscious in both places within your body and outside or only outside? No, only in the light. Me, I was not okay. conscious. In what do you body. mean by in the light? It, it was in this white light that was all around me. And okay. uh, it was all white light around me down where the 
I, my body was in the car. It was nighttime, so it was dark. So it was like a window or something in the light, or how could you see downside? I mean, yeah, you know, was... you ask these questions that require a human physical reference, and <laughs> of I, course. I just could. And even when I say that, I don't remember there being like a succinct line between the light and the dark. It's just I was in the light, and it was dark there. So you could see there. in both places. More yes, I could see both okay. places yes. at the same time. So, okay. and, um, so, but behind me again, how did I see that? I was not looking back there, but I knew it was there. There was a big circle of white, a different shade of white, and within there, there was this white being. That was more just like all white, no features or anything, with a, another shade of white radiating off of that being. Okay. Before talking about the being. You mentioned yes. something that interests me because I have seen it, that it's a, a common a trait uh, among ND, uh, ND ears is yeah. the fact that they can experience peripheric vision. 360 degrees, there is a perception, maybe it's not sight, but there is a peripheral perception yeah. all around you. You can see up, down, to the left, to the right, to the front and to the back at the same time. That's what it was like. It was more just knowing and being a part of it. Like you said, you know, I never even thought of that for years. And someone said, so you could see behind you. And I go, I don't, it wasn't really like seeing behind me. It was more just knowing that it was there. Yeah. And so right. it's hard to describe. Okay, so uh, and what about this being? The being, so part Could of Could you what, see his face? It was he... There was no features on the face. It was just this light, white light being radiating light. And um, so the being said to me, you have to go back. Your father wants you to stay. And every, I mean, everything just seemed so perfect. There was just a feeling to it, like the most wonderful feeling. And people say, do you have a body? It felt like I had a body because the feel, it was a feeling. And there was a knowing and a loving and a, you know, in the same way you're saying it wasn't really sight, it wasn't really the same as being a physical being. Okay. It was just this wonderful, wonderful thing that, and even I say that part of me wants to float into that. And, you know, I knew even seeing my head cracked open, it didn't bother me at all. It was fine. Wow. Yeah. Everything was fine. The world was fine. I my parent the dilemmas with my parents at that age seemed fine you know everything just seemed totally fine yeah another char characteristic i've noticed uh, among the people that i have interviewed is that when they reach that dimension or that stage they feel like a bliss they feel happy they feel whole, yeah and they feel lots of love it was an incredible love and but so the way it wasn't, I wouldn't say it's really like bliss because that it that's almost too too wow. much. It okay. was just so peaceful and so like people, you know, there's part of describing it's like you knew everything, but that's not it because there was nothing to know. There's no question. It's just like you knew the answers without the question being yes. there. So it was just like everything's okay. made so much sense. So the being behind me said, you have to go back. Your father wants you to stay. I knew without, again, without thinking or questioning, the father was God, not my physical father. And I went back into my body and then came to three days later in the hospital. What well, you mentioned in several interviews that later on, or, or I don't know if in that moment you realized that this being could be Jesus. I uh, I did not have any mental understanding, not any, but I didn't know what to think of it. And it was in the 70s. There was no internet. Once you had your near-death experience, you say that you developed certain healing powers and that when you touched people, yes. it felt different. Can you, talk, can, can you tell us about that? Yes, that is something that clearly happened after my near-death experience. The other things... I could see hints of it happening before, but so when I went to touch people, and still, if I touch someone, my hands become warm. And it, a lot of times it doesn't feel to me like my hands warm, but they feel the, the warmth. And to okay. me, it feels like they're warm, but to them, it feels like I'm warm. 
and I just start to notice that. And, you know, again, I didn't have any reference for what to do with this information. Yeah, and I remember that uh, Dr. Yeah. Moody, Raymond Moody, in 1975 published right. his book. And for the first time, someone used the term near death experience. So he right. actually so coined the, the, the phrase, the term. I had never heard of it. At the time, he was the only one who had written a book about it. Most people did not believe. Tell you the believe. truth, I wasn't so sure I believed it. <laughs> Even <laughs> though I knew it happened to me, it's like, what do you do in your mind about it is a whole lot different than yes. you know, you're brought up a certain way to learn certain things. And you know, the only reference I had for it really was in Star Trek, that, you know, that some of the things in there. And of course, that was science fiction. But again, that was the beginning of my understanding. So this so I, the way that I knew that, and I mean, still that rings true to me is later on when I started studying with a spiritual teacher. But it was pretty quickly after that, I met this man who was a Sufi sheikh, so okay. Islamic okay. teacher. I was brought up in a Jewish family talking to me about Jesus and Mary. And um, so, yes, I met this, uh, you know, things just lined up. This woman showed up at my door one day, said to me, I'm a friend. Which woman? Not, okay, talk, tell yeah. us about this woman. So there was, um, so I was living in Colorado. I came to visit my parents. I had the near-death experience. It was okay. this profound, wonderful, something definitely changed in me. And then I didn't know what to do about it. I came, moved back east. My mother convinced me to, and I was working in my family electrical contracting business, mostly doing office work, doing some electrical work. But it was go to work, go home. You know, I was living a normal life. And um, so this a woman shows up at my door and says, you know, I didn't tell too many people about it, but one of my friends from Colorado, I told, and her sister showed up at my door saying, I heard some cool things about you. And I know someone who teaches about what happens after we die. Oh. And then I wanted to know. So, but again, I didn't, it didn't even realize to me, I didn't realize how cool it was that this woman just showed up. Like I didn't do anything. And, you know, it was showed up and then introduced me to this teacher that I, spent okay. a number of years studying with him. Yeah, you say he was a, a Sufi master. A Sufi, yes, a, a teacher in the Sufi tradition, yes. The Mevlevi okay. dervishes that follow the teachings of Jalaluddin Rumi. Yeah, Rumi. That's yeah. interesting. So you learn from him a series of techniques because I've, I've seen several videos in your yeah. YouTube channel. And I recently saw one about the your soul meditation. Yes. And it has certain techniques that, yes, I uh, have associated with different traditions. And uh, Rumi, he, he mixed several traditions too. Yeah, and I mean, Rumi is so teaching. cool because yes. he kind of transcends religion, even though he was kind of religious himself. And he's, he's also considered a uh, master of the Sat Mat tradition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I received the Sat Mat initiation like oh, cool. 20, for 30 years ago. Why do you think you developed healing powers or how did that warmth you felt when you touched someone have something to do with your powers or with your... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I started developing that and... Um, how could you, you know, describe I, it? Uh, you touch someone uh, and you could read what was going on with him, or did you so, say something? Yeah. Yes. Again, you're talking about things we know. So I did from the very beginning get hints of what was going on, but mostly what happened is people would start to feel better. And I had a few experiences, and again, my mind was not quite getting it. And okay. so, but things happened that there were no denying. There was one with a hands-on thing, one where I prayed for someone and I felt something happen and it was for a friend's father. And the next time I saw the guy, he said, I think something happened because his father got way better that day when I did it. Oh, wow. And so again, I don't know, you know, I guess it's just part of my nature. Like I didn't even think how it was weird or anything. So something happened, this thing inside of me. And 
I, I just kept being drawn and meeting people and learning and studying. So I studied with maybe five, six, seven people that I considered to be uh, master healers that helped me develop my skills. The, the first one was at Shake, and he, okay. you know, he would say to me a lot, you know, when I would ask him specific questions, he would say, you don't need to know that. And so it, there's part of learning the spiritual things where you have to let go of the thinking. And when you're trying to pin it down to something, it can't be this amazing right. infinite thing that's in the spirit. So he was really teaching me that. And that was one of the biggest things that happened during my near death experience, like I'm on this journey and it's like, everything is, I need to learn about the spiritual aspect of it. So, so you think that your uh, healing abilities are a direct consequence of your near death experience? You know, there, there's some of that. I mean, something shifted in me where I started okay. attracting these people. The thing with the heat definitely happened. My intuition definitely increased. A lot of the things where my healing abilities really jumped a lot were from learning from other people. A big change happened then, yes. Okay. It's all sorts of different things people come to me for. So <clears throat> um, I would say usually there's some sort of pain, you know, either emotionally or mentally or physically. Um, some people do come to me, they just want to do better. They're not in such bad shape. I and mean, sometimes people want to get a job. They come to me, they want to uh, have a child. They want to do better in business, all of those things. Have you seen the changes you have produced? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, And sometimes things happen almost like instantly. Sometimes it takes more time, okay. more sessions okay. and... So would you say yet that you're on a mission? I would say I am, yes. I feel like I am on a mission. And Would you say that when uh, you heard that voice and the voice said, your father needs you, it, yeah. he needs you, he needed you to do this? Well, he Where said, you? your father wants you to re go to return or go, you know, want you to stay, actually. Your father wants okay. you to stay. That's, this is why? Because you're I, helping people? Again, I would, you know, I think that's part of my mission, but you're, what you're saying is a pretty grand thing. And, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well. so it, but I, I like to help people. It's part of I'm my mission. I'm trying to get it out of you. Admit yeah. it. You're doing, a mission. you're doing something great, I think, because you're helping people, not only yeah. physically, but also psychologically. I can relate to many experiences because i also have i also have a spiritual path and have experienced yeah uh, extraordinary things well i like that you've done research into religion because i think that's important because you know I, i said i think maybe before we started recording i don't like when people just throw out religion and dismiss it because oh yes yeah. like we were talking about rumi i mean he he was in he was islamic you know and but In the beginning of the math now it says this is the root of the root of the root of the religion and it's like ah oh, that's it it's like what's really underneath but underneath that and underneath that like that essence of loving that's in yes. every religion that you know yes, the, i is. mean the things i consider real religions you know that part right. is there so, whatever it. you say about that the you know the universe of love the universe of light whatever you say is wrong because it, you cannot express it. That's right. I love that. That's what I say all the time, too. Yeah, and uh, if you try to put a name to it, it's like the the Taoists say, if you talk about the Tao, it is not the Tao. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, But that, see, even you say that to people, then they get it because it's bigger and more than you could know. And when you describe, yes. I can't quite explain it, everyone goes to connect, even unbelievers they go to connect into that thing that we're talking about and they get it a bit so it's kind of cool okay so great talking to you uh, yeah nice talking to you thanks a lot yeah thank you